Welcome to The Greg Bennett Show. I'm your host, Greg Bennett. And today I have a delightful conversation once again with Dan Lorang. And Dan is just incredibly forthcoming with his wisdom and sharing all of his knowledge. It's just so much appreciated. Dan gives a quick recap of his journey and, and how he got to where he is. And then we discuss his athletes' performances in 2021, which is just absolutely mind-boggling how incredibly well they're all going. Um, we then go more specific into some of his coaching methodologies. There's just so much in this one. You don't want to miss this ep- episode. Just absolutely outstanding. Now, before we go on, a little bit of housekeeping. Thank you so much for listening. I truly appreciate it. the show is growing and I couldn't do it without you guys. I'm loving this journey. If you are enjoying the show, you'd be doing me a massive favor if you'd be willing to share it on your social platforms. And thank you for all of you that are doing that. It is really helping. And finally, I'd love you to support the show's partners, Athletic Brewing, Athletic Greens, Hyper Ice, and Form Smart Swim Goggles. They're all great products, great companies. Go check them out. Um, Guys, I hope you enjoy this one as much as I did. And remember, success comes to those who endure just one moment longer. A quick mention of the show's partners. These are all great companies and products that I use daily. If you want to support the show, you'd be doing me a massive favor by supporting these brands. This episode is brought to you by Athletic Brewing. Anyone will tell you that I'm someone who loves to have a beer and there's always a beer in the fridge for me and or guests that pop in. But with kids, my work and just my overall health, I I, I can't and I don't drink often. I can't afford to not be on my game and, and I simply don't like the foggy feeling I get by drinking alcohol. So I've tried non-alcoholic beers, but I guess I'm a bit of a beer snob because none of them have measured up to a real craft beer experience that I like. But now with Athletic Brewing, I can have a high quality, just flavorful and award-winning craft beer, and it's only 50 to 70 calories per can. And these beers just, they fit into any occasion. So I don't have to compromise on my social life or choose between having a great beer and, and just keeping my clarity. So go ahead and check them out at athleticbrewing.com and use code GREG20 at checkout and receive 20% off your first beer order. And that's athleticbrewing.com or you can find them at your local liquor store or bottle shop. And I'll let you know, I'll be having one every single episode I record. They're, they're that good. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice. Hyperice is my go-to solution for recovery and restoration. The handheld percussion therapy devices, the Normatec boots, and the vibrating rollers all release your deepest muscle tension and just aid your recovery. I own the Hypervolt Plus, I own the Hypervolt Go, the Normatec boots, and the vibrating rollers. And both my wife, Laura, and I use them every day before and after workouts and before bed. They're all just so easy to use at home. They're, they're quiet, easy to charge, and have ready at any time. I encourage you to look after your body. Honestly, it's the only thing you get to keep for all of your life. All these Hyperice products are just simply brilliant. Get 10% off all Hyperice products using the exclusive Greg Bennett Show code, GREG21, at checkout. Go to hyperice.com, that's hyperice.com, H-Y-P-E-R-I-C-E.com, and use code GREG21 at checkout. This episode is brought to you by my longtime partner, an amazing company and brilliant product, Athletic Greens. I'm using Athletic Greens every day. Great taste, so quick and ready to go. Athletic Greens is a delicious blend of 75 superfoods and vitamins, minerals, probiotics, and a greens blend and more to support gut health, energy, and immunity and stress. I've also been doubling down on Athletic Greens vitamin D. A huge portion of the population of vitamin D deficient, myself included. And right now, Athletic Greens will give you a year's supply of vitamin D for free and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Do yourself a favor and sign up. It makes a great gift for a family member or a friend. So sign up now and get a free year of supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase by visiting athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. This episode is brought to you by Form. In my opinion, Form Smart Swim Goggles are the biggest thing to hit the swimming world. With Form Smart Swim Goggles, you can see all your key metrics while you're swimming, your distance, your pace, stroke rate, and heart rate. The swim data is displayed on the goggle lens, and you can customize the display to see the key metrics that you want to see. I couldn't believe it when I first tried them. They fit like normal, comfortable goggles, and the display is there, but it's not in the way. 
I consciously look at the lens to see my stroke rate and my pace and my heart rate and distance. If you're a pool swimmer or an open water swimmer, I encourage you to check these goggles out. Please go to formswim.com forward slash Greg. Again, that is formswim.com forward slash Greg and get $15 off the Form Smart Swim goggles at checkout or use code Greg2021 at checkout. All right, today I'm joined once again by one of the greatest endurance coaches on the planet. He was last on the show in episode 31 last August, and that episode was one of the most downloaded episodes in 2020 and is still in the top 10 most downloaded to date. So if you haven't listened to that one, go check it out. I encourage you to do so. Since then, his athletes have continued to excel and dominate, notably Jan Fredino and his Ironman world record that he went and did on his own, Annie Hug and her mind-boggling victory at Challenge Roth. Lucy Charles and her recent Ironman 70.3 world title this past weekend, and all his success in the Bora Hansgrohe cycling team. Just absolutely mind-boggling the amount of victories that this guy has produced. What an absolute honor and privilege it is to have one of the greatest minds in the world of endurance sport join me for a chat. So welcome, and thanks for joining me again on The Greg Bennett Show. Dan Lorang, how are you, mate? Yeah, thank you very much, Greg. Thanks again for this uh, amazing introduction. Um, I get already a little bit red in my face, so. <laughs> you know but, what? Um, All I've done is point out facts, mate. That's just the facts. I've just read your resume. <laughs> I haven't done anything else. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, no, uh, happy uh, happy to be back in the show, and um, I'm going well. I'm just here, arrived in Belgium for the road championships in cycling, and um, yeah, having some some days also at the scientific congress during the week and yeah all, all fine i'm i'm happy and um, looking forward to the next weeks and months Did, when, when i read an introduction like that does it um i mean you know it makes it makes your face go red because you're a bit embarrassed but honestly it's you got to pinch yourself i mean that you've you've had a hand in and in, in all of that does do you sometimes just have to sort of remind yourself that wow i'm actually quite a successful coach yeah, to be honest, I think um, in the daily business, you, you don't think so much about it. I think that's normal and also good like that. You you do your job, you, um, and job is even not the right word because I, I'm really living my passion. And mm. But in when other people talk to me and say, hey, do you know what you achieved already or what your athletes achieved already? I always came into my mind some, um, some times at university when even uh, some of the uh, professors told me, yeah, but uh, with sport, science, you know, perhaps you will get a job, perhaps not, you never know. And I will always, always sitting there and say, hey, I will get a job. I want to do this and uh, I want to work in high performance sport. And yeah, finally, I'm here and really happy that I got all these opportunities along the way. And um yeah, just also try to encourage. Uh, if I if I have some young students that contact me or some other young coaches, I just try to encourage them and say, hey, it's it's possible to go that way. It's perhaps not the easiest way, um, but it makes uh, so much fun. You yeah, you you have the possibility to meet so so many interesting athletes, people around the sport, and I still love it. Like on the first day. Yeah, I, I love that you've you've gone from sort of that aspiring want to be coach sports scientist to now mentoring you know the young students and the younger coaches i think that's a, a great role for you you know going forward as well i think um i think that's fantastic i think anybody that's reached the top of the world and what they're doing like you have i think it's important to kind of keep all that stuff in mind so so good on you for that um what i'd like to do today um is just a quick recap of your journey and your process, because we did do that in the first episode, but um, for people that haven't listened to that, or maybe just want a little recap, we might just uh, go over your journey and process and how you got to this point. Um, and then I'd like to discuss all your athletes' performances in 2021, especially, especially. there's just been so many outstanding performances. Um, and then finally, we'll probably conclude by sort of really getting into your coaching methodology and really getting a bit more of an understanding of, of how you coach and what things are important to you. Um, but before we do that, I might crack open a beer. Have you got a beer in hand? You're in Belgium. You've got some of the best beer around. Have you got one? Any chance? <laughs> yeah, but uh, 
No, at the moment, nothing here in my room. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, mate. I should have given you more heads up. Well, I, it's, it's 10 a.m. here in Boulder. I am cracking open a non-alcoholic beer for everybody listening. Don't worry about it. I don't have a problem. But this is, a, this is an athletic brewing run wild IPA, and they do partner the show. Absolutely fantastic beer. So anyway, mate, I've got a beer cracked open. I'm sorry you don't. <laughs> Next time, actually... My last, my last lot of episodes, um, probably the last half dozen, have all been in studio, and uh, I'm missing the fact that you're not sitting here with me, um, and we are going to have to make that happen in the future. But for now, you're in Belgium at the World Cycling Championships, which sounds pretty awesome in itself, and I'm here in Boulder. Um, so here we go. Let's get into the show a bit. Let's start by you recapping you know, your journey. I guess the first question on that is, just giving the listeners an idea, uh, you know, where did your passion for endurance sports begin and why, why specifically triathlon and cycling? So my passion for, uh, for sports began already uh, in the childhood. I started with soccer. I played eight to nine years soccer and I got a knee injury uh, during the time. And so I was forced to stop it. And the next thing what I started in sport was strength training. So I went to the gym. Uh, three or four times a week and train there and I meet or met athlete people who talk about um, how much reps you have to do how much um, uh, recovery between the sets which kind of exercise you have to do and all that stuff and so it seems to me okay there's more than just mm. exercising it's really there seems to be some kind of theory behind it and I start to read books uh, a lot of them but uh, I I thought, okay, that is just a hobby. But then I went to university in Munich. So originally I'm coming from Luxembourg. I moved to Munich to make some civil engineering studies. And um, after my first degree there, I felt I have to do something with sports. Uh, I did some cycling races in Munich. I was in a cycling cup. I did cycling at an amateur or semi-professional semi level. And I, I always enjoy to, to give people some advices about sports, to about the, the science behind because... I continued to read this book to going from strength training to endurance training. And then I took the decision at some point, okay, I want to give it a try. Uh, I want to start to, uh, to study sports science. And here, the, the, the real turning point was one situation. And during my civil engineer studies, I worked in an, in an office where, uh, of an architect. And uh, he has a great passion for his job. So he was in the office until 10 in the evening and always fascinated about his job and i assist him with doing the, the the plans and i said i also want to find something where i'm in the office until 10 o'clock and i'm still happy with what i'm doing but this will not be civil engineering this has to be something else and i i, I feel that it could be linked to sports <laughs> <laughs> and then the the my boss at this uh, or the architect tells me go for it you can work here as long as you want uh, to to finance your, your study, but go for it. You have to follow your passion. And that was really the turning point where I start sports studies. And then I have the great opportunity to meet there Annie Hawk. And uh, she starts her study with me. And she was looking mm -hmm. for somebody to guide her because she was, she wants to start it with triathlon. She was a runner and she has no clue about triathlon. And we said, okay, let's do it together. I start as a coach, you start as an athlete. And that was the beginning of my coaching career. And um, so we went up uh, year by year from local competitions to German championships to European Cups, World Cups and all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, and why, and why triathlon? Triathlon is for me so complex. I, during my cycling time, I always saw the triathletes going cycling with the cyclists, swimming with the swimmers, and then in the end, run, do the run training with the runners. And in my head, it was just not good to do it was just too much so i said okay uh, i want to find out how you can combine these three sports it seems to be quite difficult to do it and that was so fascinating to me and that's why why i started to go deeper in triathlon mm -hmm. and um but i did my studies i work in sports uh, medicine department um i went then to a, um, a cycling team called um, several test team and then I start um, after some years in the German Federation as um, um, country coach in Baden-Württemberg. One year later, I was under 23 national coach. One year later, I was elite national coach. And uh, yeah, and then uh, finally, I ended up now in the, in the cycling team. 
and still are able to 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 continue to uh, coach some of the trial leads. But it's also really important for me to have that contact. But it was really a step by step process. The only thing what I had in mind was always the first step. I want to get national coach. And I can remember also when I was in, I make some education with the German Triathlon Federation. To, so to get your licenses as a coach. And there they ask you, why are you doing this? Why do you want to get a license? And I told them, I want to get national coach. And they to- look at me and say, hey, but uh, <laughs> yeah, perhaps some, we will see. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and some years later, I I really achieved that. And um, yeah, that's a little bit how, how I came to 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 sports or to co- to coaching, especially, and then over the years, I have also to say from there to now, what changed a little bit is at the beginning I was really interested in the training, in the data and all that stuff, and um, the more experience I get, the more I get also really involved in or interested in the physio- uh, the, the psychology behind the human being. So. Um, how how is the, the um, how is the psychology behind the high performance athletes working, and so to see the athlete more as an entire unit and not just uh, the training and stuff around. So I, that that was also a development step what I did um, over the last years I think. So to to really also develop a passion for the psychology behind, and um, yeah, now I'm happy with was trying to work with uh, with this high performance athlete and uh, to understand the the person as a whole and in the end um, two weeks ago, or one week ago a journalist also asked me why are you coaching and I, t- I told them first of all I'm coaching because I want to help people that they can achieve their um, their goals their dreams I'm really fascinated about the human body what you are able to achieve when you train and the last thing was and it don't get me really wrong here, but it, it sounds a little bit strange. But the last thing was because I can, because I had the feeling when I start to read these books that I can really feel what athletes can feel. So I have never done an Ironman. I have never done a Tour de France, but I can, when athletes talk to me, I really can somehow f- feel the pain, feel what is going on in them. And I think this is something what was in myself for a long time already. And that is also what a coach a long time ago told me. He said, hey, you, have, you don't have the theory, but I, I think you can be a good coach. And that's why, uh, yeah, that was also really important for me to hear this and to, to, to think, okay, I'm on the, right, on the right track here. And that's why it's for me also quite easy to, to jump deep into a person when I have time to talk to the person and when the person is also willing to open himself or herself to, to me to, so that I can really jump deep into to understand better the physiology and the psychology behind. That was a really great answer. I love, I love the fact that you, you had a passion, you, you set a goal, and you went about it, um, and it is almost the mindset of an athlete or an entrepreneur that does that, 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 that finds something they want to be passionate about, and then they go all in. Um, and for you, you know, it's almost a, the, the side pieces to that is that you end up being able to help people. You know, you're learning more and more about the human body, and uh, I love the, when you said, yeah, and because I can. It's almost in your DNA. You, you found something that is at a deeper level for you. Um, I guess on that, you know, you, You've got so many athletes. How are you managing your time between the Bora Hounsgrove team and coaching all these world champion triathletes? How, how are you? Out, and, and you got your family. Mm-hmm. How? Let's let's jump right into that. How are you able to manage all of that? Um, yeah. Uh, so I think you need. Uh, oh, oh, the big thing is that you need the right athlete for this. So when I look at my triathletes, they are all. They look um, or they have some attributes that are really important. So they look after themselves. They take self responsibility. They are able to 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 manage everything by themselves, or they have person really important persons who are close to them who help them in their daily environment. Sometimes it's a physiotherapist, it's a manager, it's it's uh, like in Lucy's case, it's the husband. So there are also other people involved in that team. Mm-hmm. I always say. With every athlete, we have a team. We have the athlete, we have the coach, but we have a team around. This team is always different from athlete to athlete, but this team building helps me to be able to support all these athletes beside the cycling team. In cycling team, it's different. There 
I have also time, um, yeah, time on deck, time together with the athletes. I'm in training camps. I am at some races. I have for sure some more contact with them. So there it's a normal, I would say a normal coaching job. But with the triathlete, it's really different. It's I, I just see them perhaps one or two times in a year uh, at some competition. So I really need athletes who are, first of all, 100% uh, trust in what we are doing and also believe that the way that we are working is working the best for them so they choosing that way it's not it's not that somebody forced them to call me and say hey could you coach me no they choose the way and we are really really open in the first talk i'm really really open and tell them that is what i can do that is what i can provide and for sure this is something what i can't provide i cannot be in a training i cannot be at every competition i can't come to a training camp so that is otherwise um, i cannot coach you even if i if i want to do it but in the setup that i have at the moment I'm. Um, I cannot do this. And how managing all these athletes? I think there we come back to the point what I mentioned. I I don't need so much time to really understand what is going on with the athlete. I just open the computer, look at the training files, and then listen to the athlete. And it goes. It's like a ongoing process in my head, and it goes quite fast to come to the point to say, okay, that could be our problem, and we could work on that, on this, on that part. It's in normal life. So I, there are so much things what I can't. I'm not a good, uh, not a good man who can work at home, and I have so much things what I can't do. But I think this is something what I, what I manage quite well. <laughs> and it's a, uh, uh, yeah, it's a twenty-four hour. Yeah, I, I love the fact that you, 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 I love the fact you're focusing on your strengths. You know, you, you know your weaknesses, and you're focusing on your strengths. And I even love the fact that you, you know, you understand that an athlete needs a team around them, and, and before you even take them on, you want to understand their team. I think that's fantastic too. Yeah, it's, it's really important to have this, and also to give the team the feeling that they are really important. For sure, sometimes the athlete is in the center. Sometimes it's the coach who is mentioned. But I always try to use the opportunities and tell the team, hey. You are really important and we need everybody of you. And I think that is also the major role of the athletes. So to keep the team together, it's like in a cycling team. When you have a captain in the cycling team who is able to win, who can motivate his team, who can give everybody in the team a special feeling that everybody is doing more than 100%. Everybody is really more than 100% committed to the goal. Somebody who is really good in it is for sure Jan. So Jan, he is a... It's a master example to yeah to have the team around and there I for sure I learned a lot uh, mm. by uh, we working with him about these facts. Uh, yeah, Jan's team with his manager Felix and obviously his wife Emma, who you know has her own background being Olympic champion, and everything else. She's he, he he's established and uh, he has a very rock solid team there where they're all in. Every every person on his team is all in. Uh, and and that's a big difference. Exactly. What I, what I want to do now is um, twelve rapid fire questions. Um, some of them are serious, some of them are a bit of fun. But all of them you can either say pass, or we're we're looking at fairly short answers. Some of them are going to be hard to be too short. But are you up for it? Mm-hmm. I'm ready. All right, here we go. One. What is your favorite thing about your career? That I live my dream. I love it. Two, what is your favorite book to read? Uh, I have a new one now, uh, 11 Rings from Phil Jackson. What is it called? 11 Rings? 11 Rings, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. I know that one. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um, three, what motivates you to work hard? Um, athletes who are 100% committed to what they are doing. So if I have the feeling that they are 100% in, that motiva- motivates me the most. It's not the success itself. It's really working with athletes who, are, yeah, who go 100%. Mm, I like that. Okay. In the last five years, what new belief or behavior or habit has most improved your life? I would say um, the, um, the the fact to deal better with let me call it failure failure of of um, 
for example, not be successful at an, uh, uh, at a competition. Also, if an athlete was not successful, the team was not successful, to better deal with this and to um, uh, separate more this the what you have in job from your, from your personal feelings. So to be able to separate this more and not to mm-hmm. to yeah to let pull you down too much about what happens in your yeah in your um, job. Let me call it like that. I think that was a process over the last five years what helps me to better mm-hmm. manage like also that. the responsibility what I have now. Mm, very good. All right, this one you can probably say this one might be a bit too uh, of a long winded answer you got to give me, but I'll, I'll give it to you anyway. If your athlete could only train 10 hours a week, what would you have them do? 10 hours a week, yeah, depending on, so if it's a triathlete, um, uh, <laughs> depending, for sure, depending on, on the goals. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you have only 10 hours. Yeah. Let's leave, that's, that's it. I, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> let's hit pass on that one. <laughs> that's a hard one. <laughs> I would say go have fun, go do what you want, and because with ten hours at least we will not win a big thing, but have fun and use the ten hours as good as possible. Good answer, well done. All right, what are bad recommend re- recommendations you hear in your profession um, that you know other coaches or other things that people are recommending to athletes to do? Is there anything that stands out to you that you say don't do that, and other coaches are preaching it? Um, I would say in general, I don't let uh, and don't like generalizations. So sometimes I give you an example. Sometimes it's about this training method is good and this is bad. This is something what I, I really, I would say, really hate. So to generalize things or to say, I don't know, carbohydrates are good or they are bad. Uh, a fast and run is good or it's bad. So I, I think you always should see it in context. And I think uh, people should always, when when people don't know it exactly, they should at least look for uh, to get all the information before giving information to athletes. Uh, if you talk, for example, as a coach about blood values, values to your athletes and you don't really have a clue, just let the doctor do it or g- get all the information you need and then talk to your athletes. Don't go with to your athletes with just half of the knowledge. I think this is something what mm-hmm. you should avoid. Good. All right. What is one of the best or most valuable um, or worthwhile investments you've ever made? And that can be in terms of money, time, or energy. What's one kind of big investment that you've you've done that has really paid off? I would say all the all the athletes that I coach for free during my student times and even the time after. <laughs> so I was. I, my account was at zero nearly <laughs> before I started to to gain money. It was the point where my wife told me, at some point, then you have to also to get money for what you are doing. How how much do you want to try? Because I was never sure. <laughs> I was never sure if it really works what I'm doing. Yeah, that's why I didn't ask for money. But then my wife said to me, hey, it works. How much time do you want to see it again? And then I started to make some money. But... I'm happy that I did it that way because it allows me to get a lot of experience. <laughs> uh, I, I, I love I love that it's your wife in the background, and I've had so many guys on the show and and um, well, and women, and it's the partner in the background that it really is the strength yeah. uh, to make us make that next big step. And I think that's fantastic. I love that. All right, next one. What is one thing that annoys you the most? Um, when uh, it comes a little bit with the same that we had already, when people talk about something that they have no clue about, so when somebody asks me about, um, fair enough, yeah, to give, so for example, if somebody asks me what can we do against COVID, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert here. I can just give you what experience what we have, but I am not an expert for that. And if you then, or, or I had a good example, if you see. If you see, for example, a, a girl or a, a female athlete and she is really thin and then people start about, oh, she has eating disorders and she has problems for sure. This is not healthy without even talking to her or talking to the coach or talking to the doctor. That is something what really annoys me. So just to to say something and without having any any information about it. Mm. 
Mm, that's a good one. Um, okay, so three light questions now. We've done some big ones. These are a bit easier. Okay, on a scale, this is one of my favorite questions to ask people. On a scale of one to 10, how cool are you? Oh. <laughs> And, and uh, 10 is really cool and one is not cool or whatever. <laughs> no. 10. Oh, you're my first 10. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not cool. I'm no, a five. I'm, I'm a, a five. <laughs> a five. Oh, he's rounded himself down to a five. All right. Here we go. Next one. If you were stranded on a tropical island, what two things would you want with you? On my phone. <laughs> Oh, good answer. <laughs> All right. And now this one, this last one, I promise, is very, very easy. Uh, which decade of music is the best? Um, yeah, 80s and 90s. So um, so I would say I, I listen more to the 90s. Yeah. A quick mini break to remind you of the show's incredible partners. You can get 10% off all Hyperice products using the exclusive Greg Bennett Show discount code GREG21 at checkout. Go to hyperice.com and use code GREG21. A quick reminder to do yourself a favor and sign up to Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens also makes a great gift for any family member or friend. So sign up now and get a free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase by visiting athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. If you want to see all your key metrics like pace, distance, stroke rate, and heart rate while you swim, you need the Form Smart Swim Goggles. Go to formswim.com forward slash Greg. That's formswim.com forward slash Greg and get $15 off or you can use code Greg2021 at checkout. If you enjoy a beer but want to keep your clarity, stay on your game, then you have to try Athletic Brewing. I was just simply blown away by how good they taste. Just a true craft beer. Go check them out at athleticbrewing.com. That's athleticbrewing.com. And use code GREG20 at checkout and receive 20% off your first beer order. Let's talk about your athletes. Let's change gear a little bit. Um, and I want to talk about your athletes' performances specifically in 2021 because when I look at you, you know, Jan Fredino and what he's done with the world record. Um, when I look at uh, Annie Hug and what she did at Challenge Roth and obviously Lucy Charles Barclay and her recent performance. Um, and then your Bora Hansgro team have had some outstanding results as well. Um, but first and foremost, let's step through the triathletes for now. And I want to start with the most recent, um, Lucy Charles Barclay and that performance at Ironman 70.3 World Championships where wire to wire – with the fastest swim, bike, and run, and won by over eight minutes. Now, there could be other world champions out there that have maybe done that, um, maybe Daniela Riff at some point, or I, I know there's been a few that have been close, but that performance, I need to know, firstly, let's start with how did this relationship start? Um, and, and and then we'll, get, we'll dive a little deeper. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I read at the beginning of the year, I read about the project um, that Lucy and her husband, Reese uh, put online to say, okay, we want to switch to short distance ways at some point and perhaps making the qualification for Paris. So I read this, I don't know if it was a tweet or an Instagram, no matter, it doesn't matter. So, and I read this and I said, wow, if you put this, if you make this public, it puts some pressure and uh, but okay um interesting and and then i like to talk to people uh, especially to coaches and i contact them um if it would be possible to talk about that project because i would just be interested in in to hear how they want to approach it what are the ideas behind it and i thought i got an, an answer from reese and he said yeah, yeah let's chat and we had a chat and we had a good chat together with lucy too and it ended up with the question, um, but hey, Dan, can you do this with us? And I say, uh, I was not prepared for that, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> so um, because they say, yeah, we are we are already some years in triathlon. We have already some success. We're working quite well. But we we think you could be the right um, addition to the team. So it's like, yeah, let me say, like, like a head coach 
driving that we drive the program together and giving your exp exp expertise to us. And, and I said, yeah, that could be a really interesting project for sure. But first of all, I have to talk to Annie because, um, yeah, Lucy and Annie, are, they are competing in the same competitions. So I mm -hmm. first have to talk to her and ask her about her opinion. And then I talked to Annie and she just told me, hey, we are working now together for, I think, 16 years and I can always trust you. We had this situation already in the past with, with Sarah, with Sarah True. And um, if, if I have fun to do it, I, I should do it. That was Annie's answer. And then I say, okay, mm -hmm. I go for it. So I contact again Reese and then we had a, a longer Zoom call. And yeah, and from there on, we started to... To, to go on that journey with the goals to win corner uh, one day and on the other side uh, try to go to the Olympics uh, in Paris and that is the journey where we are on at the moment and yeah it's quite exciting also to see the development now and also to see the good to see the good collabor collaboration with uh, Lucy's team all around I have the, um, the opportunity to meet some of them in Lanzarote for for three days and was a nice atmosphere and uh, so we have a good relation and it's not that i came and tried to change everything so i came make an analysis and then say okay that could be the way that we go and yeah now we i make the programs uh, i talk together to read about diff different ideas and then with lucy and we are working week by week so that, that's how how we started to work together mm. so on that what was the exact date that you started and and I guess also you know you didn't want to come in just you know rewriting everything like you said but what kind of changes have have you made that that have um have have helped to obviously take another big step forward I think it was um, I have to look because uh, Lucy did this um, trials in swimming for uh, British swimming and where she went for second place and then after she started again with triathlon training and she started with the camp in lanzarote that was the first camp i think it was was it the end of march or beginning of april when we really start to work together so to make plan and so that she, she trained uh, um, after my uh, training plans and then the g first goal was okay we will um, build up Fokona, preparing this and um, just it was a camp i think of four weeks and i think in the last week um, british triathlon came up and say hey lucy you can you have the opportunity to go to bts leads and uh, <laughs> yeah so then suddenly we say okay we go for it and uh, we change a little bit the program and uh, she went basically with a middle distance preparation of three to four weeks to leads and um, it was quite amazing to see what she was able to do there and um yeah and then we we continued the project um from there on and uh yeah and it was interesting to see how her body reacts on the training so really in a fascinating way really absorbing really well the training load and um yeah that's i i told her also today um on the phone um it was like writing a book so i write a theory book and say okay this training should have this effect and in the end, it was exactly like uh, like that with Lucy. Uh, <laughs> until until now, you always know if you change, you could have a good increase at the beginning, and then perhaps some kind of stabilization at some mm -hmm. point. But for the moment, it really went up, increases step by step, from week to week, from month to month, and that was is amazing to see. So, so was that focusing a little bit more on aerobic conditioning or VO two work or yeah. strength? What, what what was it that was yeah. the big change? It was there? not a big miracle because you can imagine to the when she prepares the, um, the the trials in swimming, she did nearly no triathlon training. It was a little bit on the bike, a little bit on the run. So what you have to do is yeah, build up the basic endurance. So what we do is said is okay, no matter what we will do this season we need up to build the, we need to build the base and that's what we did working on the vo2 uh, vo2 max working on the basic endurance so make some kind of polarized approach at the beginning and um try to to um also to um um adapt her body again to higher training loads higher training volumes um she also has a strength and conditioning coach who who adapt the program to what what we were looking for 
And um, yeah, basically that what is what we did in the first weeks. And then after, for sure, we went to more specific uh, training, um, depending on the competitions they had, especially for the 70.3. But the goal, the main goal was Kona. So we was always, everything was based on Kona. And then we also said, okay, let's do a high altitude camp before St. George. And then going to St. George, seeing what happens after altitude, but also what happens four weeks after. So in Kona, basically, that was also a plan mm. um, to get some experience there with her. And um, yeah, and then we uh, we make some performance testing also to see where is she physically or from the physiology side in the run and on the bike so that I got some numbers also um, that we were working with. And I have with her the same approach a little bit that I have with Jan. So it's not that we build specifically the one, specifically the bike or the swim. I, if it's even have a complete athlete as Lucy is, we build it we built her as a triathlete so we make step by step as a triathlete and not only in one discipline that is also basically my concept sometimes i have to change it if you have for example if the if the bike performance is not related to the run and swim performance for sure you have to put some blocks uh, there but basically it's quite good if you can really develop as a triathlete and that is what we did or what we are doing even now did her so her performance at Ironman seventy point three world champs in St George? Did, did that surprise you at all? Or I mean, coming down from the altitude camp, she did with with a focus still on. Well, I guess you knew before, right before seventy point three was it kind of had been postponed again. I guess that's a, there's two parts to this question. One, how much did that change your program? And two, uh, were you surprised with with just how well she performed in St George? Yeah, I. Um sometimes as a, as a coach you have these moments where athletes really really surprised you and i got this two times in, in nearly one week so with any in ross making this mm. fabulous uh, competition uh, really amazing bike performance and an amazing run performance and then uh, i think it was one one week or two weeks later then now lucy uh, where I, I, she always reported yeah I, I feel good i feel strong i feel really good and i was always like okay okay mm. We will see. <laughs> Hopefully, she's right. <laughs> for, for sure, she. I, I saw in the numbers that she's she's in a good performance. But in training, it's always hard to predict if you will have a really really good competition because the last part of it is always also the mental side. And and she reports to feel quite well. And um, I'm a, I'm a coach. You can ask my athlete. If I tell you you are really good, this perhaps hap this happens perhaps two or three times in a year normally i say okay it's it's a good session it's okay uh but um i i'm ra rarely say okay that's really good and um so that's why i was i was surprised on in the way how she performed after altitude and even in altitude not everything went went right she she came there with some kind of some stomach sickness uh, we have to adapt it she made a time trial there what we didn't plan then some some kind of stuff so not everything went smooth and in the end we mm. brought it really on a good uh, uh, on a good path and yeah and then I, I saw it on the ticker and i was impressed to be honest and happy about about her performance yeah i think i think we were all impressed i think that was one of those performances where we all step away and went wow it was a bit like when jan in in south africa 70.3 world oh yeah yeah i think that that was one of those where and yes he's kona performances but i remember that 70.3 yeah. he did in uh in south africa with with alistair brownlee and javier gomez and i just thought wow that was a performance you know that, that stands out and i think lucy's performance at 70.3 worlds is one of those for me after you know being in the sport for the last 35 years or whatever it really stood out it was wow okay <laughs> there's been here, here's lucy charles barkley who's got a three seconds at kona and a second at 70.3 worlds back in 2018 and has been had, had some wins and some success but this performance was okay there's been a big step up here that <laughs> so i i just think that one was absolutely fantastic and and now that lucy i mean now that kona has been postponed is is you know, is that still the focus for February or are you guys kind of thinking of another Ironman or what does that look like? Yeah, um, we have a plan now, um, but I'm a little bit um, um, conservative because I, 
yeah, I'm never in this kind of uh, when do you want to post what, uh, you know, about when do you want to announce that you'll do right, it. Right. That's why I don't want to say anything about this. <laughs> um, but we, we, uh, fair <laughs> enough. Yeah, we have a clear plan there now. We did it. Yeah, we did it basically today. And um, so, yeah, but for sure, uh, the goals stay the same. And I, I mentioned the goals at some point, she wants to win Kona she, or the World Championship, and at some point, she wants to qualify uh, for the Olympics. And yeah, so we have to, to, to always look in different periods when can we put the focus on the short distance, where can we put the focus on, on long distance. We, nobody of us really know what will happen in February or what Ironman will do. Will they do the championship at a different place or not? So um, I think what is important is that you stay active. Active, I mean that you are not waiting, waiting, waiting. In the end, you are disappointed about what will happen so that you have a plan, no matter what will be the, 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 the outcome, but you have um, short-term plans, what you can do now. And um, I can just tell you, physically, she feels quite good, still fresh, because she didn't that Ironman this year. And, okay, mentally, she needs now a little bit, um, yeah, not a break, but, yeah, to recover a little bit. But mm -hmm. physically, she is able to continue. And so that's why we, we, we have a plan for the next weeks and months. Well, I, I think uh, that was a very good political answer. And, 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 and honestly, it's fair enough with, it's very hard to plan these days, mm. we, you know, when you don't know what events are going to happen. And uh, I had Tim Reed on the show last week and uh, fantastic episode, just love the guy. And um, he said, yeah, you know, I was in Australia and I trained for three Ironmans and all of them got postpo <laughs> uh, postponed or cancelled within three to four weeks. So he'd done his big push, was probably just getting set to do, you know, a few specific workouts and a bit of a taper. Mm. And he and they all got cancelled. And he said it happened three times in a row. Because I'm like, how are you over here in the US? You know, because to leave Australia is so hard right now. And uh, he said, Greg, I, I just had to try and get some racing in. He's, <laughs> you know, I, can't, I can't go through another year of not getting to race much. Um, so yeah, I get it. Keep it keep it tight, um, you guys. And and we look forward to watching Lucy race again. Moving on to, we talked about Annie Hug. Um, and we kind of glimpsed over that incredible performance in Roth. That it was a, for me, it was a real shame that there, are, there were roadworks, and and so we know the bike was a bit short. We don't, I don't know if we know specifically how much. Maybe you do, but I mean, she went a seven hour fifty three, um, won by over thirty one minutes, and ran a two forty three marathon. The, it's one of those all time performances. And I'm just, my only regret is that the bike, we don't know how accurate the course was. Um, we know it was short, but um, your thoughts on Annie's race then? I mean, you guys have been working together for 15 years. Mm. Um, was that one of the standout perform performances for you? Yeah, for sure, because you have to understand the circumstances. So she did um, the Collins Cup. And uh, there she was uh, completely disappointed. And then uh, she calls me and she was really like, uh, um, will I all ever be able again to do a good triathlon? Uh, and how, sh how could I do roads? I'm not ready for this. I can never do this. And oh, what, what will the people say? Uh, some stuff like that. And so it was big, big panic. Uh, and um, yeah, we talked about it and... Yeah, for sure. I know her. It's, it's not the first time that <laughs> that we have this kind of event and um, or this kind, yeah, of talks. And then we went through it step by step. Quite uh, try to get the emotions out, go through it rationally, making a plan. And uh, but still, as a coach, even if you've had these situations already several times during the last year, also you as a coach, you always think, oh, hopefully she will have a good competition, just a good one. We winning in a normal competition and then she's happy but then she took yeah she wrote something on the course where even i said hey, where does it come from wow that that is quite amazing and um yeah this, this is what i said before it's you can from the training data you can see if the athlete is fit or not and that is what i say to any you are fit you are ready i don't know what will be the outcome but you are fit you are you are ready for a good competition and now we have to see what is the daily uh, daily performance? How is your mental uh, strength? What are your opponents doing? And uh, yeah, then she did it in a fantastic way. So yeah, also there as a coach, you are, you you got surprised by your athletes, and it's always funny if then people say, yeah, Eddie Hawk, she's the world champion. Yeah, somehow we expect something like that. And then if if these people would would have seen her 
some days before, 100% nobody would expect that, that race. So you can talk to a physiotherapist, <laughs> to all the people that she talked with in these days. So I think nobody would even expect it. Okay, perhaps people who are really close, they would say, yeah, 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 we know, we know, and we will see. So they know already this kind of uh, of, of, of panic. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was so happy for her and she was happy after it. And yeah, now everything is fine again. Well, I, I think I think that was really one of the outstanding performances, and 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 it's been interesting because we've had so many events and championships these last month or two. You know, August, September, every well, definitely September, everything's been piled in. But I think the triathlon community we're getting treated to so many just wonderful performances, and uh, that one I just I didn't want to glance over that one too quickly. You know, I'd like to have Annie on the show because I think that one that performance. Um, for me, Mark's one of the better performances she's ever had. And she's, you know, obviously won Kona and done incredible times before, but that one was, it was incredible. Um, on, on Annie, just before we move on, um, what's changed in, in your training with her over the last 15 years? Have you guys had to change a lot or has it stayed relatively the same? Yeah, I think the, the biggest change came for sure when she changed from short distance to long distance. So they are, um, so Angie, uh, uh, Angie. Annie is really some kind of, uh, I always call it, this kind of Ferrari. So she's, her body needs a lot of energy, and but then she, her body can also produce a lot of um, perform, uh, power, a lot of performance. So we have to change it a little bit to make her a little bit more economically working. And um, But still, and that is with her the biggest challenge, Um she always have in mind this short distance performance. And she has big fear about this, Oh, now I'm going to long distance. I will be so slow and yeah, I can never run fast again. So it's more, it's also a mental challenge to go together with the athletes through that process because you cannot say to her, mm -hmm. yeah, but it doesn't matter. Uh, long distance is completely different. It doesn't matter if you are fast on, on 10Ks or not because, because you have to respect her thoughts, you have to respect her psychology and then going this way together. That's why we also did a 10K run. I think last year and she did the best time ever on a 10k run in, in wow. her age and not preparing short distance race so that was what was that? yeah it was, what was that it was uh do you remember um, so she she didn't do so much a 10k so flat 10k she did a 30 33 i i think 33 flat or 33 and three seconds something like that and yeah. you have ne never done, done that in a in a in a, on a pure road race and yeah, she was mm -hmm. so happy with it. And it was also the right measure. So it was really 10K. And she was so happy and say, wow, I, I'm still fast. Cool. And so so, <laughs> so you, you have to deal with this. And that is the more difficult part of the process. And then on the other part, we I don't want to to keep away that for sure she also dealt, dealt with some kind of, of major injuries, what we have to take care of and to come back with uh, some um, some kind of big hip problems in the past. And um, so with her, we always look with the minimum am amount of running training that to get out the maximum performance, because we know if mm -hmm. we go over a certain limit, it could be an issue. And that is something what is harder to deal with. With other athletes, perhaps they are able to support more load, then it's much easier. But if the athlete has his limits, some kind of biomechanical limits, then it's, yeah, it's really, we have to work really precisely and do a really careful build up to not overdo it and that's what we did with Annie in the last years and um, also with the swim um, she had for example 2019 she has in, in the Ironman she has I think one of the best swim performance ever and uh, we are working also on, on this together with a with the swim coach and um, yeah try always to improve and do something better no matter if she gets older from year to year but always try to yeah, to work on on, on different aspects, and uh, because it's so fascinating when you talk to her, I have the feeling she has still the same motivation as as if she's when she started with Twilight. That is quite amazing. Uh, if you mm. keep that motivation and this passion for years, the same with Jan, for example, it's it's so crazy when you talk to him and and to her when they talk about trial and about yeah competition training. Yeah, sometimes it's hard uh, when you talk to younger athletes, you don't feel the same passion. Sometimes it's, yeah, it's it's really interesting. And 
it gives you a lot of energy also when you work with these people. I think uh, you've just touched on Jan, so we'll talk, we'll talk about him for a moment, but it's, uh, I think he's been on the show quite a few times now, and, and, and one of the things that seems to really fuel him is this target that's you know, placed on his back by his peers, by the media, by by everybody, right? They and, and he he almost embraces that target and uses it as fuel. You know, it creates that anxiety that then becomes fuel, and so his motivation and his passion just increases, increases because he's like, I don't want to be beaten. I don't, you know, and uh, and he just keeps stepping up and stepping up. And uh, it's been an incredible year that he's just had um, with the tri battle royale where he. He, he set the world record for the iron distance in what seven hours thirty five minutes. Um, you know he, his performance at Collins Cup was amazing. Miami earlier in the year. The one thing that was missing though this past weekend was his decision to not race the seventy point three worlds and have a nice race between him and Gustav Eden. Um, Jan did outsplit uh, Gustav at Collins Cup by about twenty seconds. And I think that would have been a really great race. But I know between you and him and, and Felix, there was, you have your reasons. But as a fan, I was bummed not to see not to see Jan on the start line in St. George. Uh, was that a hard decision for you guys? Hmm. Um, I think now it would be good to have Jan in the chat because we, to be honest, we never talked. <laughs> we never talked about it. So it was never a subject okay. because uh, when we look at our work, we have really clear plan with Jan always. It's, we don't change it just so so quickly so it's a really we have this um how also he calls it the shots sometimes during the year and we plan it and mm -hmm. when he's at the start line he wants to know okay i'm at 100 percent um because everybody uh, expects nearly that he wins uh even if now mm -hmm. it gets harder and harder there are so much or so many good guys on the start line and i think um so we uh we said, okay, we want to do an Ironman this year. We want to um, to find a possibility to do an Ironman, and uh, for that, the seventy point three championship is just does just not fit into the calendar. It just makes just no sense because when he's going to an Ironman this year, he also want to to show a, a really good performance, and that's why we said, mm -hmm. okay, we um, Kona will not happen. What is Plan B? We made a Plan B, and. Um, but then it's really focusing on the Ironman and not saying, okay, then I jump to the 70.3 uh, championships. And that is, to to be fair, and, uh, that is how we are working all over the last years, really to plan things and then go it and not just coming out of, of nothing and saying, okay, then I just doing something completely different. I, I think this comes from, yes, because if we see it like, the, I, I, I completely understand as a fan, it would have been amazing to see him in racing there <laughs> and i'm also um i also think he could have delivered a, a good race but you must um also see his position if you go on the start line he can he can always lose he can just lose mm. and mm. if he look if he will for sure he if he lose someday he will at least be uh, sure that he came there with 100 percent, and then he lost and not being not 100 percent prepared and then got beaten by somebody i think that would be um, not that what he want from himself. Well, I remember when you said last episode, and it, it really stayed with me. You said my athletes don't use races for training. You know, when they go to race, they go to race, and that means they're prepared when they get there. And and that's exactly what you're saying. Um, when Jan Fredino turns up, he's going to be ready. You know, and be ready to get 100 percent of Jan. But otherwise, yeah, he's not going to hop on the line. So you can have cheap cheap shots at him and uh and, and then he's only at 90 percent and trying to maybe use it as training or something else you're not going to do that so i mean how is how's your you know you guys have been together was it 10 years now it must be going close to 10 years how has the training sort of changed with you guys yeah um we it's now we have i think in, in yeah, nine years now um uh, it's the ninth season together um when when young or when i um took over Jan at the end of 2012 yeah 2012 it was um his performance level when I saw the performance test was yeah was quite low so I always thought about oh wow these are the performance data from Jan Frodeno oh okay I was quite surprised but surprised in uh, not about uh, how good they were but uh, that we had a lot of work in front of us 
and uh, mm. yeah in the first years uh, he also start, uh, started on short distance so it was a smooth transition from short distance to long distance with the big goal to win Kona 2015 that is an, an agreement what we made when we start on the first day our uh, relationship and uh, our work relationship and um, for sure what we what we find out during these years is how much intensity does he need how much volume does he really need so for sure he is doing a lot of training but that we also give his body enough rest um, to absorb all the training so to find out how his body is reacting on that and um, also what he he learns during the year is um, to listen to the body so um, not to go over that point again and again but really to listen and to understand what is what the coach mean with the session so for example if i put there um i don't know for example i say okay go six times 10 minutes at threshold and perhaps there is something like i don't know 380 watts and um, but it should be threshold and then he he feels that that day that he cannot go there for sure he will try to push to go to 380 watts but at some point he also knows okay he wants me to be at threshold so if it feels completely different then he is also able to reduce a little bit the power at some point um and and to really listen to his body okay it's not his favorite so it's r rare that this happens so normally he always wants to execute what is on the plan he's really looking for this because he's 100% um convinced that if he fulfills the plan he will be ready for the race that is a little bit i think something what he put in his mind and um so he always is working on the upper limits so if you put him a range of values you can be sure that he tries to reach the upper limit but on days where he, he <laughs> feel not so good perhaps he learns also to accept the lower limit and not to completely put everything in question and to give the feedback so i think that is also was also a process over the last years and um from training what we adapt is a little bit the same like what i said from from any we have to to um we work uh, uh, for a long time during the season we work like I would say middle distance athletes. So the training is more based on short and middle distance training. And just some weeks before, so let me say perhaps six to eight weeks before the Ironman, we really con focusing on an Ironman. So it's not that we are doing the whole year Ironman training. Um, mm. That is a little bit also the approach what I what I have with Jan, and what would, works quite well for him. And um, then sometimes like this also for the preparation for the last race we, we we also did some performance testing to see how his metabolism metabolism is working and to see if we are right because if you're working together with netlets over years you know normally how it's reacting but it could be that you're also wrong that you think the body is at that point but it isn't and that's why at some points we also make some kind of control just to see if we are on on the right spot and um yeah so that's why we have a um over the years really uh, we understand us blind i would say so he knows what i want from him and i know what he expects from me and that's why we are working quite well and then like i mentioned already he has a great team around him with the physiotherapist with his manager his wife his family so it's um the whole team always what makes this performance possible and it would be i would just lying if i would say okay we change this this point and everything went in a good direction no it's always an 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 ongoing process to find out okay how what is the direction of the body measure it and then going from there again and if we find a way to prepare it's not that we change this year by year we we also adapt we we adapt the learnings from the last year and uh, or we take them and just adapt them a little bit and yeah until now his body is still, uh -huh. still reacting and even 2019 was the best performance ever he showed on a long distance race so even with the age of uh, nearly 40 or 39 his body is still responding in a quite good uh, way yeah i i think uh in my view on that i think he's got still a few more years <laughs> in my own personal experience it was around that 43 was my kicker it was like oh i'm suddenly running a 32 minute 10k rather than the 31 off the bike or something uh -huh. and that was enough that now, you, now you're not competitive um and it was for me that was the bike power stayed 
the swim was okay still to some degree, but the run, for whatever reason, that was the one thing that just fell off on me. So it'll be interesting to see in this next couple of years um, if between you and Jan and his team, if you can keep that that speed and power going. Um, and I also got to add, <clears throat> you talk about, I remember doing my final, one of my final run workouts was with Jan in 2016, I think, 2015, 2016 in Noosa. And you had him set up to do, I think we were doing 1K on and if i said on was 315k pace or something and then 1k easy at four minute k pace and then 2k on and then 1k easy kind of that thing and i remember running with him on the easy part <clears throat> when we're meant to be running four minute k's and all of a sudden i hear him just swearing ah i'm like what's going on mate he goes that last k was a 402 he was so hard on himself <laughs> in the easy part uh that it was a 402 and not a four minute i was like ah we were running trails and rolling, you know, it wasn't, <laughs> I was with Tim O'Donnell and, and Jan and I think all of us are like, there, there's an intensity about that kind of, he wants to, he wants to find the next limit, you know, he wants to keep pushing and pushing. So I've seen that firsthand, what that, what that's like. Um, I, want, I also want to move on now and just ha- quickly discuss uh, your training methodology a little bit more. Um, we could talk a lot about the the cycling team that you, you're working with, but I think for now, I, with the time, I don't want to take so much of your time. I actually want to just talk more a bit more about, you know, the, the training that you guys are doing. You've mentioned a couple of times in the episode that, you know, you, you collect this data and then that gives you an idea of where to move from. What, when you, when you say you collect this data, what are you specifically looking for as a base measurement to then have an idea of where to work from? Um, yeah, I, I, I try to put it in words. Um, so First of all, I I'm looking where where is this, is the athlete standing from the meta uh, metabolism point. So what is his uh, for example, what is his VO2 max? What is his lactate building rate? How is his economy? Um, so just looking at at these numbers to see okay that is the metabolic profile. I think that's a good uh, good uh, mm-hmm. good term to uh, uh, yeah to say what I want. Yeah, to start with. So having a metabolic profile from the other, there are different methods how you can do it. It doesn't matter which method you're choosing, but just that you know, okay, that is what is going on in his body at the moment during the run, during the bike, and uh, during the swim. And then you say, okay, I have t- competitions, I don't know, three months uh, to go or four months to go. And then you know, okay, which kind of metabolic profile will be necessary to perform at the highest level at that competition. And then you you mm. make your um, you you take these uh, four months and you make different kind of phases and um, in, a normal build up. I, I mentioned it uh, sometimes. A normal build up in in my program is always at the beginning you have some kind of um, adaptation phase, so get the body adap- adapted to higher training loads. Then we have some kind of yeah, you can call it a VO2 max phase. Um, I would say in this phase, we train uh, polarized. So on one side, we are doing intensive intervals with VO2 max intervals. On the other side, we are doing high volume training with low intensity. And after this phase, mm-hmm. we are going more to specific work with strength endurance. Uh, and, and at the last point, we have uh, race-specific um, exercises. So depending on short, long, a short middle or long distance competition this is roughly uh, uh, um, the build-up that i'm doing and sometimes i do this build-up two times before the competition sometimes one time but in this in this period you can for example in a view to max period perhaps you also find sometimes a short session of strength endurance a short session of rate specific so that mm. the body gets mm. already used to this so that it's not some kind of completely new when you start with the specific block mm. so i try to mix it up but to put focusing on different metabolic goals and then for sure i also have to see when i'm, I'm doing a vo2 max period is the vo2 max or is it reacting so do i have a higher vo2 max at the end of the block or was the intensity perhaps too high or too low or was the volume for this kind of uh, work perhaps too high or too low this is something what i try to find out that after these blocks and then it depends from athlete to athletes with some athletes i work in rhythm with two or three weeks of load and one week recovery with other athletes we have five to six weeks of load and one week recovery really depending on the athlete and uh, uh, and on where we are for example with lucy when we started i saw okay there's 
not so much training in advance. So we have to go slowly and we have to do a two week block, making some recovery days, then another two week block and so on. But now we would also be able for with her to do a three week block. So it's really try to get the body used to more and more load in an, in an, um, and not to rush that way. No matter if, if you have the competition in front, you cannot, um, uh, flick your body let me call it like this even if you want to you cannot just be by increasing intensity or by increasing volume from one day to another just uh, expect some miracles the only thing what will happen in a short time you can have an improvement but suddenly after this there can also be an overload an injury or something like that that's why i say okay you have to slowly increase it and accept it that it is a step-by-step process and that's why I often see also development over years with my athletes, like I said, with Jana, with any who who are able to perform at the highest level, even at some kind at the end of their careers, in the last year of their careers. And I think that's quite amazing to see. And that's the, mm. uh, the philosophy that I go. So always looking. So one main thing is to see how much load the body can really support. And now comes the bad thing about this. There is no metrics for this. So there's not the metrics that say mm-hmm. you... TSS is now at that level. That is what you can do and you cannot do more or less because most of the values or nearly all the values take into account the cardiovascular system. But no, none of the values take really into account the, um, the, um, the bones, the tendons, mm-hmm. so uh, the, the body mm-hmm. itself. And these are the, normally the limiting factors. For sure, you can also be overtrained by just by, by your cardiovascular system. But the biggest risk is just to get injured or to get overused and this is something what come with with experience and and th- there comes now also the point uh, when the platform you want um, it doesn't matter so i open the da- training data i look at the weeks i have in mind the information from the athlete i make my notes and then i take a decision about the next uh, about the next steps but I could not say uh, this is now the algorithm to take always the same decision. That is a little bit the, mm. the complicated part of it. And uh, uh, often, and, and also now with the software available and with the uh, artificial intelligence, I think we can come close to that. Software can help coaches to make their life easier. But I think the the kind of decision making, what I said or what I try to explain now this kind of decision making will never never a computer program can can do that because it's mm-hmm. it's so complex and even hard to describe and um yeah so that's that's how i'm working that that was a really great <laughs> that was fantastic what you just said then because it, it gives us a good idea of of how you manage your athletes and their programs. Do you, are you, you know, you, you do the testing to start with um, VO2 lactate economy and all of that kind of thing. Are you repeating that on any kind of schedule, like mm-hmm. at the end of going through your VO2 specific phases, are you doing retests quite often as well? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but not that I'm do- always doing retests with lab tests, for example, but uh, I try to define a standardized, standardized training session. Uh, for example, a classic run, uh, I don't know, eight, eight times, thousand, uh, eight times one K and in specific speed. Mm-hmm. And this is also a performance test. So if you, in the end, look at the speed, the heart rate, okay, you have to see what was the temperature outside and all that stuff. But if you're doing this time by time and you have expect a, a certain amount of improvement, you also have a performance test. So I, I never want to, um, to miss a training because I have to do a performance test or to be recovered by a, for a performance test. That's what, not, not something what I want. Mm. The only thing what we are tapering for is races and not for, we are not tapering for performance tests. So that's why I try to integrate a performance test or an, yeah, uh, uh, yeah let me call it a performance test in normal training. Sometimes this could be a lab test. Sometimes it's just a normal standardized training session we have also some specific bike bike protocols uh, with uh, three minute, ten minute, eight minute testing outside, where I have developed over the last years some kind of matrix where I also get the values out. But it's always part of the training. It's never like okay, and now we taper one week, and then you have the performance test, and then mm-hmm. we see where we are going from there. That is 
I did this in the past. I would also not say it's wrong, but I just saw when I make after an analyze of the season that I lose just too much time with this kind of, of mm. work. So that's why competitions, and this is the last point, competitions are also performance tests. And sometimes they have of really great performance <laughs> tests because we train for them and not yeah. for a great number mm. of tests. But um, t- mm-hmm. the numbers are some kind of, um, or these tests are also an, an objective base to talk to your athletes because if I have these sessions, for sure athletes, they can also compare. They are not they are not stupid. They can also compare last session to, to the actual session and come to you and say, hey, but, hey, coach, last time I was, I could pu- push five watts more uh, and now I have five watts less. So what happened there? Yeah, and then you have to find explanations and and. Yeah, and sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes you really have to go deep and analyze it and say, okay, perhaps it was this or that. Uh, but it's also a control for the coach to if you are on the right way or not. And it's more than fair to be honest to the athletes because it's you should never forget it's the career of the athlete and we should do everything what is in, uh, in our hands to help the athlete to to perform at the best level. For sure, the coaches are also involved. It's also a coach career behind, but um, but but that doesn't change anything for me. So you have to be honest to your athlete. And if you see no development, don't tell him that there is a development. Okay, but perhaps before a competition, if you want to do some mental thing, but don't don't <laughs> don't tell an athlete that he gets better if he's not getting better. Because at some point, you're just lying into your pocket, and, and that is what I also mean. Uh, how I deal with my athletes. That's why I'm so careful with saying, well, this was really good. Because when you say to an athlete, this was really good, you create expectation. Because really good, perhaps Mm -hmm. for me, means, yeah, it was a good training session. But for the athlete, it means, well, now I can win the next one by 10 minutes in advance, something like that. So you have to be really careful about choosing your words uh, when you uh, give comments to training sessions. Well, that's your psychology background. I like that because <laughs> athletes are very, <clears throat> we're, athletes are, uh, are always that kind of one moment away from not believing in themselves. You know, they're very fragile and uh, and you get used to sort of managing the different personalities. Uh, I want to ask you a couple more questions just on the specifics of that training. Um, you know, you mentioned the the high, to start with, you know, you start with the polarized training, the, well, you, you start with adaptation first, but then you move into VO2 and the polarized work with the whole high volume. What's an example? Can you give me an example of what kind of VO2 work you would do? Like it, it, say for a run, what, what what is a great VO2 workout that you enjoy and how does that with them work into the, the high volume mm-hmm. that you would, an example of that? Yeah. For example, on the run, uh, I like to do the VO2 uh, work uh, uphill. So um, for sure sessions that you also know, perhaps in a different context, like three times, eight times, 30 seconds uphill, and then you go easy down, then the next one. So with good stride, good technique, and um, then we go up with these times until two minutes. And um, if you have two minutes, sometimes it's good to do it on a treadmill, so to reduce a little bit the recovery between, and so that you don't have to run down. Mm-hmm. But um, the VO2 max in running, I really like to do it in on a hill. Because for sure you can also do it on a, uh, on a uh, in the flat, but on the flat you need a really high speed, and if you run at high speed, the risk of injury is, is higher, and that's why I, I like to mm-hmm. do this, this kind of efforts uphill. Also, when the technique is not the best at the end, when you get tired, the risk to get injured is higher when you do it in the flat, and um, and then we can also end up in some kind of intervals like uh, classic ones like four times, four minutes uphill, something like that. But it's always a build-up. So sometimes I see training schedule or training plans. You have a normal training week and then comes the big key session and it comes out from nowhere, four times, four minutes, uh, VO2 max efforts. And yeah, for sure, this is a big impact on your body. But uh, uh, you, uh, I always have the concept that the body has to be prepared for that kind of training. So... I always started with, like I said, 30 seconds, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, then 40 seconds, so 40, 20s, and then perhaps one minute, 30 seconds, something like that. So to really to prepare the body for these kinds of impact and not to to read a, a really hard session somewhere and put it in a training plan because it sounds quite hard. Uh, you really have to be careful about what do you want to achieve with that session and uh, where is your athlete at the moment? So if you have a session, a really big, if you, 
I don't know, you talk to a coach or you have a big session in mind, then think about, okay, how can I prepare this session over the last weeks? For sure, the benefit is not coming from one session, but I'm 100% sure if you prepare this session really good, the quality will be better, the, um, the, the, the outcome will be better, the execution, so everything will have a higher quality and has, will have a higher effect in the end. Mm. I, I like that. And so when, when you're doing the, the higher volume around it, how many of these kind of VO2, when you're having this polarized workout, how many times a week would you be <clears throat> touching on VO2 work? Is it one swim, one bike, one run a week or something like that? Uh, I would say um, in total, we would have um, around four to five sessions and spread over the three disciplines, depending a little bit on the athlete and on the situation. But And the rest of the training, all the rest of the training is easy aerobic endurance. So all, uh, everything else what mm. we are doing is really aerobic endurance, even with some recovery rides or some recovery runs. But um, there you have to take care that you don't um, invest too much energy or too much oxygen because otherwise the turnover for the whole week is just too much. And if the turnover, mm -hmm. also the... Um, um, protein turnover is too high then your body is not able to have an um, anabolic training um, training effect then you come more in a catabolic process so that's why the um, the, um, uh, the the polarized approach is also so interesting and so uh, uh, and normally riskless if you don't overdo it in the intensity because as long as you keep the easy work quite easy so, um, like I said, you mm. have then four to five of you to make sessions and around this, for example, a specific day could be having uh, a view to max in the swim, having a, um, um, a view to max in the run and then a really easy, um, bike ride. So that could be one day, the day, the day after could be a really easy day with a long, uh, we're starting with an, a normal run and a long ride after perhaps then you come with a recovery day and then you do again, a two or three day block that could be, for example, an a topic and all my trial leads they do normally two to three training or disciplines per day um just on the recovery days we just do two or one or two so um yeah it's it's about then dealing well with the with the intensity and, the, and also uh, what i sh what you should not forget is the intensity for the vo2 max has to be in the right range vo2 max is not all mm -hmm. out uh, sometimes athletes uh, are confused or uh, don't understand. I, I have one example when I put this workout first time with with a runner. It was a female runner. She wrote me back, yeah, I did, I did the uphill sprints really well. I felt good. And I said, what did you do? Yeah, uphill sprints. I said, no, <laughs> it's not a sprint. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's a controlled intensity. And so I, I tried to explain this. And um, that's quite important. Especially when you have an athlete with mm -hmm. a high lactate building rate, you have to be uh, really careful that they are don't, don't overdo it so that they are not doing a high anaerobic training because then it goes in a completely different direction. Absolutely. I, I think that's one thing. Yeah, everybody takes VO2 and thinks flat out. And it's like, no, no, no. At VO2, you're still breathing oxygen. You're yeah. not going into anaerobic debt. It's not, <laughs> you, you still have the ability, but it's, it's pushing that, that little window of the ability to move oxygen around the body. Uh, at, at a higher level um uh, with, with the recovery side of things are you collecting data when it comes to recovery heart rate variability or glucose monitoring do you do any of that or is it just athlete feedback um no so uh, it depends on the athlete so i really like uh hrv um so the heart rate variability if athletes are doing it um uh how do you call it free will so if they are also interested to do it and if they do it uh, daily on a good base and if the data if you really have good data then i like it and um there i like the hrv itself i like the rest heart rate a little bit to see the process also in altitude this helps a little bit better to understand what is going on uh for sure the feedback from the athlete is, is still the most um yeah the most important also the sleep quality is uh, quite important mm -hmm. for me um but it's not that i say always to the athlete you have to do all these metrics so i tell them this could be important this could be is important this would be nice to have and then it's about the athlete to choose okay what um will i do every day what it can can i in include in my daily routine and then i work with this and um i so sometimes come with some new stuff and say can we implement that can we implement that but in the end the athlete has to 
to implement it in the daily routine. With the glucose monitoring, um, um, I, I, I also tried it. I had it with some outlets. You can get some info. It's interesting to have some kind of calibration. For example, if you eat breakfast and you want to see how is my effect of a banana, how is my effect of, uh, of, uh, of oats or of chocolate or whatever uh, on my blue glucose, then it's quite interesting to see the other differences or during a ride to see what is happening or, what, or how is my glucose when I start to feel hungry, at which level is it, how does it change when I take my nutrition and how, how is the impact of the nutrition on my blood glucose. Um, that could help you. And what is quite interesting to see is during stress. So after stress, for example, or when you have stress, you see that uh, after this period of stress, your glucose level still stays crazy, goes up and down and doesn't come back to a normal value. Uh, or it needs some time to come back to a normal value. So that is some kind, something what is interesting. And, um, but it's not something what I would use now the whole year or doing all the trainings or whatever, or to get too much focus on. Um, so it's nice. Mm. You can use it for a calibration, but it's not something what I use on a daily basis with every athlete and what I would, fo where I would focus the attention of the athletes too much on. Um, yeah. Well, mate, you, you have given so much in this last <laughs> hour 15 and I, I truly appreciate it. I would like to finish with um, two questions, which I like to ask each of the guests because I feel like we all get a nice little takeaway from them. Um, so I, one question here is what is, I mean, you've given so much that this is almost erroneous, but let's go with it. What is one tip you have for people on just how to optimize their lives? Um, one tip is um, just sitting down and say, are you happy with what we are doing? And no matter what you're doing, if it's boredom or not, no, you should always go back to the point why I'm doing what, what I'm doing here. I, I, I ask this, my coach colleagues, I ask these the athletes, why are you doing the job? And just think about that. And then coming back to the points why you started it. And then you feel, oh, that's why I started triathlon. That's why I started to, to be a coach. So sometimes it makes really sense to come back to that point and to enjoy again uh, what you're doing or to find out, mm -hmm. oh, it's not what I, it's really not the way that I wanted to go. So then it's time to change it. That is something uh, what I have. That's a big one. Yeah, what I have really good experience with, and what it just takes some minutes to reflect, but it gives you so much in the end to to see. Wow, I'm at the place where I want to be, cool, nice, or in the other way. Well, I like that. I I used to just say, "Do you know who you are? Do you know what you want?" Yeah. And are you control? Are you in control of your own life? There's three kind of questions in that, but it basically comes down to what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, very it's good. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I like that very much. And, and okay, next one. If you could sit and have a coffee with any living person, who would it be, and why? Um, I mentioned uh, the book Eleven Rings uh, from Phil Jackson, and uh, I would really be interested to sit together with him. Um, so because I read now about his life uh, as a coach in with the Chicago Bulls, with the Lakers and about the, how he dealt with all his personality, how he dealt with his personal life, the questions he asked himself. So that would be really interesting for me to, to, yeah, to chat with him and just to listen to uh, somebody with so much experience, even if it's a different sport and not only about the sports experience, also about life experience. I really like to listen to people and uh yeah about their experience their life their thoughts so it would be quite amazing to have that well you and me both mate that's why i started this podcast it's like i get to have these incredible conversations with people like yourself and athletes and coaches and doctors and entertainers and entrepreneurs and just getting behind the their journey and their process and and learning from from it's just it's it's why i do this show it really is. It's unbelievable just to be able to delve a little bit deeper into individuals' lives and understand their journeys. Um, but, mate, this has been fantastic. What's next? What do you got? I mean, the year's been pretty big already for you. You're almost done or what's happening? Yeah, ju just to finish this, I think uh, it's really great what you're doing there and it uh, only works when you also ask the right question and when you are interested in the person behind. Otherwise, it's just not working. Otherwise, it's... Uh, yeah, you can also buy a magazine mm -hmm. and read it there. I think that is really, 
really important to ask also the right questions and to be honestly interested in it. And so that is something when I listen to your podcast or to all the fantastic guests that you have that, yeah, it's a passion that you have also now for that. And that's something what, yeah, what you can hear also when you listen to it. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, what is, Thanks, mate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's up with me? I have well, now the World Championships in cycling, I say, and um, then... The season is nearly over. We have Paris-Roubaix and with the cyclists and uh, some of Italian races. Kona is cancelled, so uh, I will not go there. And then at the middle of uh, October starts already the preparation for the first team camp with the cyclists uh, for the next season. And October is basically also the month where you sit together with the trial leads and talk about next season. Some are still in the season. Jan will do an Ironman. Um, Lucy, we will hear in the next uh, weeks what she will do. Any uh, will start in the 70.3 in the next week. So, um, yeah, still a lot, a lot is going on. And then, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's uh, when something, once things stop, the other things go on. And that is so nice in sport. <laughs> There's never, yeah, ne never, an end. and, um, uh, yeah, but, but I like it. And, um, so, uh, uh, I don't know the exact word in English, but it was never boring uh, in my life until now. So, no, and it will not get. That, 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 I like that. <laughs> you, you keep moving. You keep moving. Are you going to come over to to watch Jan in, in, in the Ironman? I, I'm going to probably go out there. I'd love to sort of just sit and chat with you in person. Um, are you planning on any trips to the US if you can get over? Yeah, um, I would really love to come to, but it's uh, exactly where we have the team camp, and um, yeah, there, there I have mm. to go. That's otherwise I would really like to That's come. Cool. Perhaps I come to US in November for some aerodynamic testing, but um, and hopefully the next year. Hopefully we'll have an, a normal year again, and then perhaps we can meet somewhere. Oh, Greg, come it would on. be fantastic. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. Oh, Dan, mate, I can't thank you enough for all your time and just all all, all the your knowledge and your willingness to share it um, is just unbelievable. And I know everybody listening is is truly grateful for your time and and sharing so much because we all. We all just want to learn from the best, <clears throat> and and you really are. So, mate, really, really appreciate it. Um, everybody for listening, thank you. Um, if you're enjoying the show, I'd love your feedback, and you feel free to share it. Um, you can find the show notes, timestamps, uh, links, and coupon codes at bennettendurance.com forward slash media. All right, Dan, mate, that was fantastic. Stay on the line, mate. Cheers. Thanks a lot for listening. If you enjoyed the show, your support would truly be appreciated. You can visit the Patreon page or you can subscribe with your podcast app of choice. Don't miss the next episode, so subscribe and be notified. For show notes, if you want to know more, please visit bennettendurance.com. I'm Phil Liggett, and on behalf of Greg Bennett, here's to the next time, and I hope you will join Greg again very soon.